We're going to talk about um, community and its purpose, and we're going to talk about influence in just a minute and, and why it's important. Amen? Do you all know it's important? So it is very important, and um, I want you to try to remember some of the things that Mark talked to you about last week. Do you all mind if we just tonight is going to be kind of a teaching moment for the house? Are you all good with that? So a little bit different than preachy, we're going to do a little teachy tonight. Mark was a little teachy last week, too, and I know sometimes that, that we come and we like a big bang boom kind of moment, but this is going to be a sit, and I really want you to kind of take it in. I don't mind if you talk back to me. I don't mind, you know, if you take it in, but I want you to really, really comprehend what I'm going to say about relationships and about community because it is important. It's not just important in the Word, and we're going to look at that tonight. It's not just something that Jesus said was important or that Paul said was important, um, but it is something that is a core value of our house a core value specifically for this house, for Believer's Church. And I, I know we have people in here tonight who maybe it's your first time with us. So, and certainly you can glean from this and you can take hold of it because it's actually a core value of Christianity. But I'm, I'm, I'm bringing it in a little bit deeper tonight to a core value of who we are as Believer's Church. Do you know if you are a part of Believer's Church, then you take on our mission and our core and our values. Part of that becomes part of who you are because the, body sa the Bible says that we're a body who is fit together, that we're joined together, and that, that we become one as a group of believers who represent Jesus Christ on this planet. And specifically for Believer's Church, we represent Jesus Christ to one another, to Douglasville, to the streets that we live on, the places that we live. So it gets very, very specific, this, this act of Christianity. It's a very specific thing. It's not just something that is vague and just, just an out there thing. So we're going to bring it home tonight to us. Is that all right? All right. Well, Father, we come to you right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, and we're thankful for the word of God. We're thankful for the truth of God. And we're thankful that the truth of God penetrates our hearts. Lord, and even as Mark taught us last week, that, that if we read something and we agree with it in theory only, that we're really just fooling ourselves. That, that's the only person that we're fooling. And so, Father, I ask that you help us tonight as we look at relationships. God, something that can be a little bit complicated in our lives as humans. And I ask that you cause us to understand what it means when the Word of God says that we're to influence one another and we're to make disciples and we're to go and allow our life to, to impact the life of other people. I thank you that our hearts are open tonight, that our ears are open tonight. Father, that we hear you clearly and that we, we obey, and it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. So I want to um, preface things with, you know, preface before I get started with, I am just as much a work in progress as anybody else in this room. So do we all hear me? We all hear me when I say that. So if I come across as a little direct tonight, I want you to know that, that it's for myself too. I, I know my weak areas. I know where I'm weak when it comes to relationships and being vulnerable and um, being accessible and all of those things that, that we're going to talk about tonight. So I want you to know that, that we're all on a level playing field. All right? So I don't want anybody to think their toes are getting stepped on. My toes get stepped on, too, when I read the Word. Mark's toes get stepped on. We all are continually having the Word of God shape us. So um, at the beginning of the year, one of the things that I was most thankful for in 2017 was that I had friends. And I know you say, my gosh, you're 40-something years old. We'll leave it at something. Something years old. What do you mean you have friends? Well, I moved in the middle of my 40s. I moved, and not only did I move, but I also moved um, on the heels of restoration. So Mark and I had been in a process of restoration. And in that process of, of restoration, um, we had met many new people, but they were not people that I had done life with for a long time. Some of the people that I had done life with for a long time were no longer in my life. And so um, when, when I moved here, there was a little bit of an apprehension. How many of you have, have been apprehensive before when it comes to building relationships with other people? You've just been in, in places in your life where maybe your heart hasn't been as open as it needs to be, or you've been the least bit guarded. Life can do that to you, yeah? So it can cause you just to, to guard yourself. And so 
when we moved here, there were so many things on my plate. Um, there were things like making sure that my children are, were okay. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was a big deal. And, and so I was getting a senior in school. I was concentrating on my family. We were in a brand new home, brand new school district. And friendship just was not high on my list of priorities. In fact, it was probably one of those things that was still one of the places in my heart that I had guarded that I had set aside for, for God to begin to work on and heal. And sometimes life does that to us, and God understands that. God understands that we have things that we take to him, and, and they're just his and ours for a little bit. And we ponder things, and we begin to work through. But at the end of 2017, I looked back over my life, and I thought, gosh, five years later, I have friends. You know, and it just was one of the things that I celebrated um, at the beginning of the year was that, that I have friends. And um, when we hear the word community, sometimes it can scare us a little bit. Sometimes we read about the believers in Acts, and we hear the word community, and we think, what does that mean exactly? Like, does that mean I'm going to have to, do I have to start a farm with somebody and uh, share crop and milk cows together? Do I have to give them everything I own? Like, everything I possess is just like, are we just like, are we going totally Amish now? I mean, like, what are we doing? So when we hear community, it means so many different things to so many people, depending on, on where we're coming from. Um, and, and the thing that I think that the Lord meant when he talked about relationships stems from, stems from his interpretation of what we call the law. Remember that conversation he had um, in Luke, Luke 10, 25 through 27? He's having a conversation. And this guy asked him, Lord, what, what have I got to do? H- how do you even interpret what this thing is that we're supposed to be doing with you. How do you interpret the law? You know, you say you've come here to set us free from the law. You've come here to do all these things. What's your interpretation of this? And Jesus said that the law hung on two commandments. Y'all remember the story and what I'm talking about? So he says, I want you to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And then I want you to love your neighbor as yourself. So the whole law, like everything, like he's coming in on the heels to, to fix us and set us straight, and that's what he narrows it down to, are those two things. And a lot of times we spend our whole Christian life really running hard after the loving God. We run hard after that because it's a real personal thing, right? It's God make me holy. It's God make me more like you. It's God help me to, you know, all of these things that we want to chisel away on ourselves, And we just keep it between he and I. And that's only half of what he said that we needed to do. The other half of it is that we're supposed to be having relationships with people here. We are supposed to be loving them like we love ourselves, And sometimes that's the very last thing that we want to do. A lot of times we're good with me, myself, and, and my, my own self, my own family, my own needs, my own day, my own everything that I have to do. But yet the Bible says in Luke that Jesus said that that's just not what it's about. So for those of us who are maybe a little more introverted, those of us who love a book and an electric blanket, thank God Lucy got an electric blanket for the whole family. She thinks she got it just for her this year. So, But for those of us who are good with that, just cozying up with our little blanket and our Bible and our book and our computer and watching every sermon that we want to online, listening to everybody that we can and just growing our little selves into some spiritual giant at home alone in our closet, um, this sermon is going to stretch us. Okay, y'all ready to be stretched, ready to impact one another? So get your Bibles out. Um, We are going to talk about a lot of Scripture tonight, but it's only going to be in um, Ephesians and Philippians, and we're going to start in Ephesians with just one Scripture, and then we will spend the rest of our time in the book of Philippians. So um, we're going to be talking about the Apostle Paul and what he felt... um, about what he felt about community and um, particularly influence, particularly the word influence, which is what I believe we are all supposed to be doing when it comes to community. So Ephesians 4, Ephesians 4, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 11 through 16. Ready? He says, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers for the equipping of the saints, 
for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And he's talking in these passages about church, particularly right here, what the body of Christ is to do. Till we all come into the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, everyone say whole body, body. everyone say that's me, me. you are a part of the whole body, the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. So Paul is telling the church in Ephesus here that there is a purpose for you all to be together, and it's to edify Christ, right? First and foremost, it is to edify Christ. There's a purpose and something that everybody brings to the table to edify Christ together. Now I want you to turn over to Philippians 1. Philippians 1, and we're going to tie these two passages together. Philippians 1, 19 is where I'll start reading. Paul is in prison, which is where he is most of the time when he's writing the New Testament. He says, For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer, the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing shall I be ashamed. But with all boldness as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now I want you to really pay attention to verse 22. He's sitting here and he's thinking, he's in prison. And he, he's basically saying here, you know, it, it's, it's maybe not looking too good. Right? And there's a possibility that I could die. And I have to wrestle with this thought all the time. I could die. And then he says, but you know, to to die, I know it's going to be gain for me. I know it's going to be a gain because to be with Jesus is such a good thing. He says, but if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit for my labor. Yet what shall I choose? I just can't tell. I just can't tell. For I'm hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart And be with Christ, which is far better, verse 24, nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. To remain in the flesh is more needful for you. And when I read these passages that Paul was talking about, I thought, well, well community is really important. He tells us that we, that we have to be together in Ephesians. He tells us that there's something that the, the body is supposed to do, which is to amplify, exemplify Christ. And then he sits here and he says, not only are we supposed to be exemplifying Christ to the world, but I know that if I continue here with you, I am a benefit to you personally. That in that place that I fit together, that I'm a benefit to you. I have influence over your life. Your life is better because of mine as we're fit here and we're joined here together. So my question to you tonight is whose life is better because you're in it? Whose life do you have relationship with that you are influencing? That you are bending their character or their nature or their habits or their desires. You are creating change in them. You are affecting who they are. Whose life? And I had to ask ask myself that too. Whose life do we affect? Who is better because you are here? What does it mean that, that it's more beneficial for me to stay with you? Can you imagine? Can you imagine thinking that it's more beneficial for me to stay here with you than it is for me to be with my Savior? That is somebody who is living a laid down life for someone else. Exactly like Jesus, a laid down life for other people. This man who was in prison, who had been beaten, who had constantly come up against battles, beaten, shipwrecked, sick, all of these things that the Apostle Paul went through. And he says, when it comes down to it and I'm faced with an opportunity that I might die, that I come to the conclusion that it's, it's more beneficial that I just stay here with you. And I'm not talking about taking care of children. 
That wasn't his, his point. We all as mothers can think, God, yeah, I need to be here for my children. So I'm not talking about your children or your spouse. I'm talking about that his life impacted other people. And your life cannot impact other people if you don't have relationship with them. If you are not in community with him. It cannot impact other people if you're, you're at home tucked in your electric blanket watching Joyce Meyer on TV. It doesn't impact him, which is one of the benefits of being part of the body. Part of the body. It's one of the benefits of these last days, how this thing with, with going to church and being in relationship with each other, it's, it's one of those things that's kind of on the teetering line nowadays, right? Because we live in such a technological world. We can get fed. We really can get fed 24 hours a day, Right? We, all we have to do is plug up and, and go online, and we can have the best of the best being taught to us. Yet the Bible says that there's a reason that we join our lives to one another, that we supply one another, that we benefit one another. So, so we are going to look tonight, we are going to take a look through the book of Philippians, and we're just going to look at Paul's life. What could have he meant by that? How can I, too, come to that conclusion? That my life influences those that I'm around. That it's more than just a hi and a hello and that if they never saw me again, that it really wouldn't matter. There would be nothing added or taken away from their life if I was in it or if I weren't in it. So I want us to look at his life and and we're going to think about this tonight. Um, You know, 2017... We, we took a huge turn, I believe, and, and probably a turn that had been coming um, into what I believe is one of the most selfish societies I've ever seen. So I know I'm only 40-something, um, but it, it has really been one of the most selfish years that I have watched unfold in, in my life. So, so much so that I don't even watch the news anymore. So I, I just can't do it. We are politically sh- selfish. We are racially selfish. We are selfish with our genders. We are selfish with our time. We are marching for everything, every right we can come up with. And and we have just created a lifestyle that focuses on us, (coughs) that focuses on us. We cannot be that kind of people. We cannot be a people who it's all about me and all about us. So when is the last time, I'm going to ask you this, when's the last time you gave yourself selfish, unselfishly to somebody who didn't look like you, somebody who didn't act like you, somebody who didn't talk like you, somebody who didn't believe like you, somebody who didn't know what you knew, when is the last time? Because if we're influencing people, they're different than us, right? If we're creating a change in someone, it's going to be because we've had an effect on them. Because we've imparted something to them. We've given them something. There's a benefit that our life holds to them. So I want you to look at Philippians 1. We're going to begin looking at the life of Paul. Philippians 1 verse 12 says, But I want you to know, brethren, the things which have happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. My chains are in Christ. What, what happened here is Paul is in jail and he's saying there's something that's evident to everybody around me. How many of you have had kids sneak cookies and they try to tell you, I, I, it wasn't me. Right? We've all, uh, Victoria Kate had a little friend who came over one time. And all my kids have done it. I don't know why this other kid stands out in my mind. It's not like I'm throwing her under the bus because my own kids have done it. But um, th- th- this little girl, we had birthday cake. And, I mean, she, I don't know how much she had, but it was all over her face. So she comes back in the living room, and um, we're like, oh, did you have some cake? And she's like, no, ma'am. 
I mean, it's just, she's dripping in it. I mean, the evidence is all over her face. I'm like, all right, well, come here. Let me wipe your face kind of thing. Evident. What is evident when people look at your life? When people look at your life, what is it that, what, what conclusion are they coming up with? If they don't bump into you at church, do they come up with evidence that you are a Christian? If you bump into them on the soccer field or in the gymnastics room or on the baseball field, is there evidence? Is there something that they see? And this is what Paul was saying. And not only was he saying that there's evidence of this, he's saying these things that have happened to me, meaning the negative things, the fact that I'm in here in prison in the middle of a negative moment, still there is evidence that I'm in here because of the blood of Jesus and that I'm free in him, that he's broken every chain that I have. So the, the deeper question here is when you go through negative things in life, how many of you are going through something right now? Raise your hand. All right. How many of you have been through something before? Yeah. So we're, we're one of two people, right? We're either going through something or we have been through something. That's negative. What, what mark and testimony did that leave or does it leave with those who are around you? Because most of the time when we're going through negative stuff, the testimony that we leave behind is that we're in grief, that we're bitter, that we're in despair, that we're mad, that we're angry, that we are blaming someone, that our life is falling apart, or that we're depressed, right? That's what negativity does to us. Negativity leaves us with those things. We leave with regret. We leave with shame. We leave with blaming. We have all of these things that follow us around that are the evidence that something negative happened to us. And sometimes we don't even have to have conversations with people. We just see those things. And we're like, well, yeah, they're depressed because something happened to them. We see evidence that something happened. Well, gosh, they're really bitter. You know why they're bitter? I mean, when they were two, somebody did something to them. And so they're 50 now, and they are carrying around this bitterness. So this evidence, this baggage, kind of follows negativity in our life, right? But not for Paul. For Paul, in the middle of a negative moment, in the middle of this thing that was not so good, people are seeing that he is free in Christ. Every chain he's got has been broken in Jesus Christ. So if we're to be influencers in this community that we're in, we're going to have to take the negative things in our life, and we're going to have to allow them to point to Jesus, and I wish that I could pick your negative story for you or that you could pick it yourself. We don't get to pick the negative. We don't get to pick what, what battle it is that we're facing. Paul didn't get to pick that he was in prison. He didn't blame anyone. He wasn't cursing anyone out. He wasn't saying to the church, why, why haven't you all come to see me? And why haven't you gotten me out by now? And it's your fault that I'm in here anyway. If you would have been praying and doing what you were supposed to do, I wouldn't even be in here. It's your weaknesses and your lack of faith and your this or your that or somebody who did something to me that I'm sitting here in prison. Nothing like that. Nothing like that. He's just like, it's so cool. They're seeing that I'm free, and they're preaching. Did you know now they're preaching? Like the guards are preaching, the other prisoners are preaching. Jesus is being manifest in the middle of his hell, in the middle of what's going on that's not so good. So how many of you know you can have not so good moments that good comes out of them? That is a person who influences their community. That is a person who, would, who you want to bump arms with, you want to be in relationship with, and that is a person who you should aim to be, that you would be an influencer of people, that they could look at your life and say, you know what, I don't know what it is, but even when all hell is breaking loose, even when everything doesn't look good, smell good, sound good, taste good, and is not going good, there's something about them that they are just totally free in Christ. How many of you are there yet? Yeah, no, not me. me. Me neither. So it's it's a journey, right? It's something that we aim to do. We aim to be this person whose stuff can happen to us, and we can just say, my gosh. You know, the story that Mark and I have is not one that I would pick. It's not one I would pick for my kids. It's not one I would pick for my life, for my testimony, for anything else. Do you know how many people have been impacted for good because of what the enemy meant for bad and for destruction? And if I'm not careful, I can lay in bed at night and I can hear these voices that want to want to impart shame or guilt. When I think about people who were hurt during that time, I can think, gosh, we sure did let a whole slew of people down. When I look at Mark, sometimes I can think, oh, I really need to be mad at him. When I look at, you know, whatever, there's just things that, that the enemy would like to twist and would like to, to make, make us think and would like to make us pick up. But yet, time and time, I remind myself of the goodness of God and the faithfulness of God. 
and how I saw God's hand in a way that I would have never seen it before. And not just for myself, but for other people. I began to look at the life of other people who have been impacted. Other people whose lives has been influenced and changed. And the same thing can be true with anything negative that you face. Absolutely anything. I know some of you are facing battles of sickness today. And they wouldn't be battles of sickness that you would choose Right? They would be things that you would just rather rather have never had to pick up. Some of you have battles in your relationships that would be battles that you would have never picked, would have never wished that you would have had to have walked through. But I'm telling you that God is no respecter of persons. And if he did it for Paul and he did it for me, he can do it for you. So take those negative things and lay them at the feet of Jesus. Run them through the blood of Jesus. Everything in your life, you need to be able to pick it up and you need to be able to run it through the blood of Jesus and say, what does the blood of Jesus say about this? Because that's all that matters. All that matters is not what you say, what somebody else says, what you feel, what somebody else feels, which is where we like to live. We like to live in a place of feeling. Run it through the blood of Jesus and say, what does the blood of Jesus say about this? And, and you will be set free. I promise you, because the blood of Jesus speaks a better word than we could ever speak over our entire life. The blood of Jesus speaks redemption and restoration and health and wholeness and healness and victory every single time every time so take those negative things and lay them at his feet and be an influencer for the kingdom be an influencer let the evidence be that God is bigger is he bigger do you believe he's bigger then let that be the evidence when people look at your face that they see crumbs of just the goodness of God the goodness of God left on there number two Philippians 2 Looking at the life of Paul. Philippians 2, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort, if any love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, being of one mind. Star verse 3. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. Nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each one esteem the other person as better than himself. Let each one of you look out not only for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. Do you make decisions that are solely for your personal gain and your personal benefit. Because if you do, you're not living to bless someone else. Do you find it appropriate to go to people and say, let me tell you what I need from you? Do you find it appropriate to go to people and say, well, you know what, I, I would love to do that for you if you do A, B, C, and D for me. When you look at your relationships and you evaluate them, are you constantly struggling with what, you, what need of yours is not getting met? Because that's not the purpose of relationships. It's not the purpose of friendship. It's not the purpose of marriage. It's not the purpose of acquaintanceship. The Bible says that we are bondservants to him and we are here to serve other people. We are to serve with all lowliness of mind. All lowliness of mind. And I'm telling you, sometimes being a wife and being a parent, so, I mean, when you're locked in the restroom and your children's fingers are coming under the door, you're thinking, just leave me alone just for a minute. I do need something. I need a spa day. I need a facial. I need a massage. I need money. I need my needs met. I need you to cook tonight. I need you to do the laundry. I need, I need, I need, I need, right? And nowhere, nowhere are we told that that's how Christians live. Nowhere. Marriage sounds real good until we get to the part that it's not about me. It's about him. Right? It's about other people, and that's what relationship is, and that's how Paul lived, and that's how Jesus lived. They lived in this very low place. I don't mean low emotionally, like depressed. I mean low as in I am here for you to lift you higher, to give you what you need, to provide what you need, to find out what you need, to serve you and to love you and to clothe you and to feed you and to take care of you and to give myself for you until I am totally, what, dead. 
till I am totally dead. Most of us don't live dead. We live very, very alive. We live with these needs that we have, and it frustrates us, and we live frustrated. You can't influence people being frustrated because your needs aren't being met. The Bible says that we are to give, and we are to give, and we are to give, and we are to give. It doesn't say we're to bargain, and we're to make deals, and we're to watch out for ourselves. We're to make sure that we are not getting taken advantage of. Nowhere. Nowhere. I mean, sometimes you think, well, surely in the workplace, we're not supposed to be taken advantage of. Right? I mean, surely not. Surely in my marriage, I'm not supposed to be taken advantage of. I I just can't find the scripture. (laughs) Sounds real good, but I can't find it in there. It's supposed to be me giving, me giving, me giving. I laugh at my mom. Because she's 70, and she's, she's in another country. She stays through hurricanes. She stays through tornadoes. She stays with these people in her home who I'm like, do, do you know them? She's like, well, no. Do they speak English? No, but they're taking care of me. I'm like, hey, you have lost your mind. Get, you know what? All so she can feed and love on people. Just feed and love on people that she doesn't know, she's never seen, she doesn't have a relationship with, she can barely scrape up the money to feed them and take care of them, and that's just what she wants to do. I just want to feed them and take care of them. I just want to feed them and love them and take care of them. You know what? It didn't start when she was 70. She wasn't thinking, gosh, I just want to be a missionary. I just want to be a missionary one day. I mean, never. I never heard my mom in her prayer closet thinking, I'm going to be a missionary one day. It's my life's goal going to have the title of a missionary. Never. You know what she did? She started taking in nieces and nephews and broken people and people she worked with who didn't have any money, people she worked with who didn't have any food, people she went to church with who didn't have any money, didn't have any food, people she met on the street who didn't have any money, didn't have any food, over and over and over and over and over again so that I'm looking at her thinking, these people are, they're just taking advantage of you, Right? They're just taking advantage of you. And now here she is at 70, the most fulfilled I've ever seen her in my entire life, getting on airplanes and going over and feeding people in dirt huts, laying down with them on dirt floors, just doing what needs to be done because she she learned to live a life of lowliness, making an impact, making an impact on somebody else. And it's how we're supposed to live. We're supposed to live influencing other people, influence them. You know, I I thought about this at Christmas. How many times are we just checking off the list? Checking off the list of everybody that we've got to get for and not doing one sincere, genuine thought about who are they? Well, I wonder what they would like. Well, I'm not sure what they would like because I haven't had a conversation with them really in about eight months, but they're on my list. I've got to go get them something. That's not relationship, people. That's not thinking of them. That's not esteeming them as higher than, than yourself. So it's important that we learn to do that. It's important that we, we humble ourselves. And that we take time for other people, that we take interest in other people. Instead of having conversations with them that always revolve around us. Have you been around those people that just always revolves around them and what they're doing and what they're thinking and what they're going to do next and what they did last week versus having a conversation with somebody that says, tell me about you. And maybe it is boring as all get out to you. Maybe you could care less about it. But to exemplify Something where you're building a relationship, where it's not just about you and what entertains you and what feeds you and what makes you feel good, but it's pouring your life into someone else, pouring your life into them, taking an interest in them, esteeming them. That's when you'll become an influencer. Number three, Philippians 2, 8. Philippians 2.8 says, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore God 
also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth those under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord therefore my beloved as you have always obeyed not as in my presence only but also much more in my absence work out your own salvation with fear and trembling for it is God who works in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you should shine as lights of the world. Obedience is directly connected to us shining as lights in the world in a crooked and dark and perverse generation. What kind of generation do we live in? It does, it, there's no rocket scientist needed to look at the world and know that we are crooked and we are perverse. The things that Stella Evans comes home and tells me goes on in a sixth grade classroom are beyond my comprehension. Beyond my comprehension, a crooked and perverse generation. And the Bible directly connects obedience to that. And I know that's not a great word in 2018. It's just a word that sings. It just stings. We obey intentionally because we're a light. We are a light. And we have to remember that we are a light. Instead of seeing how crafty we can get with what he tells us to do, we just need to simply obey. And sometimes when I watch our lives and I watch our appetites and I watch our desires and I watch the things that, that we want to do, and I mean we as adult Christian people, and I enter into conversation and I hear stories about adult Christians and the behaviors that take place, the things that take place in our relationships and in our personal lives, I just wonder, like I try not to judge try so hard not to judge and sometimes I think we treat the things of God like a 16 year old boy tries to tries to treat the scripture that says not to have sex before you get married you know how he treats it he treats it like okay I know that it says that but what exactly does that mean <laughs> right like what does that mean yeah, <laughs> that is what it means. <laughs> but you've met those people who just play with, with the commandment just long enough to try to dissect it and figure out, I mean, does it mean, like, do I not hold hands? Do I not, like, do I not kiss in the car? Like, can I kiss in the front seat of the car and not the back seat? Like, after I kiss in the back seat, then what? Like, like can I? <laughs> right? So, and we do that with the things of God. He just says, don't do this or do this. And we have these month-long intercession prayer meetings about him, about what does it really mean? What does it really mean to love your neighbor? What does that really mean to forgive somebody? And we're like, forgive. What does forgive mean? I mean, and we go back, we act like we're a kindergartner, forgive. Now, does that mean, like, does that mean, like, that I can't, okay, so I need to look at him when I pass him? Like, we're passing down the church aisle. I need to say hi. Like, is that what forgive means? Like, do I need to send them a letter or a phone call? Um, so I can't, does it mean I can't gossip about them anymore? Is that what forgive means? And we take these things and we just toy with them. Like, they're just these little toy words that God says. And that's what we call obedience in 2018. And that's why it's all over the spectrum. And it's whatever we want it to be. Well, what you think obedience is for you, that is great. You take it and you run with it. And then we've got people on this extreme over here who think it's something totally different. And we're like, yeah, that's good too. Sounds good to me. So obedience, it, it's just not that complicated. It's like he said it, do it right? So don't play with it. Don't just make it all these things that we want it, want it to be. Um, it's just interesting. You know, I've got a, a little Bible study that I do for middle school kids called Sun and Moon Girls. How many of you know sixth grade girls, the number one thing that they would struggle with would be drama, right? So sixth grade girls and drama. And so when I begin to ask them what it is that they need or what it is that they struggle with, all of them just kind of look at me and they're like, gossip? Gossip, right? So, I mean, it just drives, I mean, they're little girls, right? I mean, and a lot is going on in sixth grade. Um, and so, Cell and I have this deal. 
we have this deal that, that, that I'm trying to teach her how to honor her friends at school, how to respect her friends, how to respect everyone else. But sometimes friends can be irritating in sixth grade and the rest of life too. But in sixth grade, sometimes they can be irritating. And so I've told her, I said, honey, we're not going to get in habits of gossip. We're not going to get in habits of gossip. So if you need to tell anybody something, like if you're just going to burst about what you think about somebody, you, you let that be mama. We don't need any more drama going on in school than what goes on. And so she'll begin to have these conversations with me. And as I'm teaching her about honor and respect, there are some things that I let her say. But after a while, after a while, it, it bleeds into a line, right? And so even with Stella, I'm like, oh, honey, that's enough. Because it's becoming gossip now. We're, we're crossing a line. We're not honoring. So you have to be very careful with what, what, what it is that God says to you. And you have to do it. You have to obey quickly. You, ha you have other people watching you. A pr perverse and crooked generation is watching you. We're commanded to have influence over them, right? Remember the beginning scriptures that we read were fit, were joined together, were, were put here together so that why? The end of that scripture in Ephesians said, so that the world can see Jesus Christ, that he can be glorified, that people can see a body that edifies Jesus. That's the only reason that you're still here, is that you would edify Jesus. That's why he hasn't come back to get us yet, so that we would have relationships and create atmospheres that edify Jesus. That, that is our purpose, and that's why we're here. So we need to obey intentionally. People are watching us. Philippians 3, verse 1, still looking at the life of Paul. Philippians 3, verse 1. says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to, to write the same things to you are not tedious, but it's for your safety. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of mutilation. He's reminding them to beware of people who would come and want them to live in the flesh. To remind them of religion and the religious laws is where he was headed right there. He's saying, because we've been circumcised who worship God. Worship God in the spirit. Rejoice in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in your flesh. He says, though I might also have confidence in my flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I have more so. And he then tells them everything that he's done. Circumcised on the eighth Day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness, which is the law blameless. But what things were to me, were gained to me, these I have counted as loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. Everything, everything from our birth to today, basically. The good, the bad, the negative, the positive, the jobs, the successes, the resumes, the accomplishments, the victories, the defeats, every bit of it. Every bit of it. He basically says, it's nothing to me. That's so contrary. It's so contrary to how we live. Everything about your life and your story serves only to know him better or to bring him glory. Everything good that you've done, everything bad that you've done, everything that you could list for your life's accomplishments, everything that you really worked so hard to do, that you spent years studying, you spent years crying over, travailing over, Letting God help you with dung, the Bible says. <coughs> that hits pretty hard. That hits pretty hard to think it's nothing. Like it's nothing just knowing him. We're just a people, as much as Jesus wants us to be a people, that it's about our heart and our relationship with him. We so love success and failure. We like that system. We like the system of brownie points. We like thinking, I could do something really good today. 
And he would just give me a check mark and just say, way to go. And so we lived like that. And there's such a difference between knowing him in here. There's such a difference between knowing that, that it's not this religious law and, and it's really not the law that we read about in here. It's our own laws that we come up with and that we create that make us feel good about ourselves. Make us feel like we've just done something great. And we just create them. And we live our life like that by our, this own little moral code that we come up with. And, and we, we like that. We like knowing I can make it happen or I can blow it. And even when we blow it, we still are... Maybe depressed, maybe upset about it, maybe we carry a little bit of shame and a little bit of guilt. But some of us, that system is so familiar. It's so familiar. And I encourage you today to, to let go of that system. That system that would just sit around and, and let God be a, a plus or a minus kind of God and let your life be a plus or a minus kind of life. That's just not what he's asking for. He's asking for you to be a people who at all costs know him. At all costs know his voice. At all costs, at the drop of a hat, you are his ambassador to do whatever he calls you to do at that moment. Those are the kind of people he's looking for. And Israel didn't get it. It's why that 11 days took 40 years. They were so used to a system so used to, to not understanding circumcision, so used to not understanding that I'm supposed to be led by him, I'm supposed to hear him, I'm supposed to follow him. So used to it. That's not what we're supposed to be. We are supposed to have zero, zero confidence in our flesh. Number five, and I'll end with, with this one, Philippians 3. Are you learning something about relationships tonight? Are you understanding their importance? Are you understanding that it's important for us to influence other people so that we can be a body who influences Douglasville for the kingdom and the name of Jesus Christ? It's the kind of people he wants us to be. Number five, Philippians 3, verse 12. Paul says this, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I don't count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. What is your life's aim tonight? What is your life's aim? I know your mama's told you to be good in school and to make good grades and to marry somebody good, to get a good job, to raise a good family. But is that where your life's aim ends? I sure hope not. Paul says, Paul says, I'm going through this life trying to attain something. We could start, that, that could, we could talk about that for an hour. Just attaining something. Being intentional about life. Going after something. What are you trying to attain? Some of us I know would just sit day in and day out and days pass and months pass and years pass, decades pass and we look over our life and we think, I have done absolutely nothing. Paul says we're to be attaining something. We are to have an aim about our life. Our life is to have focus and purpose and we're to be going after something. What are you going after? Ask yourself, you don't have to answer me tonight, but answer, answer in your heart and, and with the Lord. What is it that you are purposed to go after in 2018? I appreciate the weight loss journals. I appreciate the, the getting my uh, little calendars out and giving everything administrated like it needs to be. I appreciate putting money in the stock market and making some. I appreciate paying off houses and cars. I appreciate all those kind of goals, getting your kids grown and married and through college. I can appreciate all of that. But if that's the only thing you're reaching after tonight, you are falling short 
falling short of his design for your life, falling short of what it is that he has for you, ask him. Ask him, what do you have for me? What do you have for me on this planet in the year 2018? And what is it you want for me to do? Find out. Run after him. Run after him. Set him as your goal. Some of us would do good with just that. We would do good with just Jesus. That's what Paul was saying, just Jesus. I count it all, all the rest of it, I just count it as nothing. Just Him. 100% Him. Some of us don't even know what that means, for it to be just Him. Sit in a room alone and ask just Him to show up. I dare you. I dare you to sit in a room just by yourself. Say, Jesus, show up. You show me who you are. You speak to me. You do something with me. His life's aim and his life's goal. He took, he took after it. And then the Bible says that he pressed on. He pressed on. It wasn't a bunch of yo-yo living for Paul. Y'all know what I mean by yo-yo living? Yo-yo living. We're good to go after something when we want it, while we want it. But when we're done getting what we want, we, well, not very after it right now. Right? It's kind of like the way we date. Mark and I were good before we got married to pursue one another 115%, right? We were up at 6 o'clock every sinking morning in college. I would get up to go to early morning prayer. Why? To worship Jesus, right? Or was it because there's some motivation that this man that I love is at early morning prayer also? Right? Never again since we've gotten married have we gotten up at 6 o'clock to pursue one another. Never. Played racquetball together the entire time we dated. I don't play racquetball. I don't know how to play racquetball. I don't know what I did in the racquetball room when I played racquetball with him back then. No idea, but I played racquetball and ran. I ran like a crazy woman. I hate running. Hate it. There's nothing about it that I like. And every day, yeah, do you want to run? Yes, I want to run. Of course I want to run. I'm a runner. You know, and run. do I look like a runner? No. I'm not a runner, but every day, every day, as soon as we got married, right, got what we wanted, a little comfortable with each other, finished the honeymoon, a little familiar with each other. We don't need to play racquetball together anymore. I mean, we barely need to even speak. It's like, are you home? I'm home. Okay, good night, right? So go after it. Don't yo-yo live. And we're like that. We're like, yes, God, I want you 100% you. I want you. What? You mean I have to wait on that? Like, no, God, I want patience. Oh, my gosh, God, this is so irritating. Don't send me something irritating. Don't send me that. I don't like that. It's irritating. We want our bills paid, right? God, help me. Help me pay my bills. Yes, I trust you for finances. You want me to give? No. No. No, and we're just in and we're out. In and out, hot and cold, up and down with God all the time. That's yo-yo living. Paul said, I fix my eyes, I set my aim, and I pressed on. I pressed on. That means I went and 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 I went. And I kept going, kept going, kept going, kept going, kept going, kept going because I wanted the prize. Do you want a prize this evening? Do you want him? Do you want his eyes looking at your eyes? Do you want him to say, well done, good and faithful? Do you really want to impact your neighbor? Do you want to impact that person? Do you want to have relationship we want relationship until they rub us the wrong way and it doesn't feel good and now I'm irritated and now I do have to go to church with them and now I do have to forgive them and I do have to walk down the aisle and speak and say hello. That's how we treat relationships. It's the body of Christ and I'm telling you that is not the goal for Believer's Church and it is not the goal that Jesus Christ has for you when it comes to being an influencer and being in community. We are commanded to influence one another. We are commanded to be in community with one another. 
commanded and Paul laid it out beautifully for us, I could have gone on and on and on. Olivia looked at my notes today and she said, you have a lot of scripture. I said, I know. Have you ever read Ephesians and Philippians? Like, have you ever sat down and opened up the book? I mean, it's just like verse by verse by verse, line upon line, precept upon precept of the way we're supposed to be living. The way we're supposed to live. I want us to rise to the occasion in 2018. I want these, these B groups are just a portion of it. And I don't want to lay a guilt trip on you tonight to sign up for a B group or not. And B group leaders, you can go back to the tables um, and sit in front of your sheets. But I do want to encourage you. It's a great starting place for relationships in this body. It's a great place for you to start so that you can get to know one another and that you can impart to one another. We all raised our hands at the beginning that we've either gone through something, we're going through something, or we will be going through something just because of life. And we are commanded to be the body to one another, to supply each other with what needs that we have. We shouldn't have to go searching and hunting for our needs to be met when we're in a body. Right? We're in a body supplying one another. So I encourage you tonight. I encourage you to let your light shine. Let it shine so that people know Jesus Christ. People know Him. People see Him. They have evidence. 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 Bow your heads. Thank you, Jesus. As Michael plays, I just want you to ask yourself, what kind of evidence rests on your life for the people you have relationship with, the people who see you, the people you see every day? What kind of evidence does your life speak of? Does it speak one of regret and shame and guilt? Is it a life filled with evidence of something negative in your life? Or is it a life that points to the fact that Jesus Christ has set you free and has broken every chain that the enemy has tried to encamp and bind you with? I want you to ask yourself tonight what kind of an influencer you are and what kind of an influencer you really want to be in 2018. I want you to get a picture of your life's aim before you walk out this door. A picture of your life's aim. What you want it to speak of. What you want it to smell like. What you want it to look like. What you want it to taste like. 